Hello. For two years in a row, Turkey was named the world's worst jailer of journalists, followed closely by China and Iran. In 2010, more than 100 journalists were in prison, most of them Kurdish reporters and editors. That number has since dropped significantly as government discovered new ways to control inquisitive reporters, including charging them with insulting the president. However, in December, a number of journalists were detained, including Ekrem Dumanli, the editor of Zaman, Turkey's best-selling paper on government conspiracy charges. Just two weeks ago, reporter Mehmet Baransu was arrested, charged with disclosing state secrets. Yesterday, as police were taking him from prison to a hospital, he told fellow reporters, one remains speechless in a country where a journalist is handcuffed. Anchor woman Sedef Kabash was in December charged with up to five years of imprisonment for her tweet in which she called on citizens not to forget the name of a judge who dropped the corruption probe in, that involved high profile names and former cabinet member, members. Almost 1,000 Turkish journalists lost their jobs in the past two years, among them chief editors, columnists, reporters, cameramen, photographers. For some, even a couple of critical or ironical tweets were reason enough to terminate their job contracts. A Rome correspondent for Sabah Daily was fired because of an interview with an opposition leader that her husband, an Italian reporter, did for the Italian daily La Repubblica. Yavuz Baidar, a prominent columnist, was fired after the editorial board censored two of his columns related to the Gezi Park protests and relations between media and the government. As a result of government pressure, and ties between media owners and the power, self-censorship has grown significantly. Yavuz Baidar, a recent Schoenstein fellow, in his research paper quotes an unnamed, an unnamed columnist. On a lot of subjects, I applied self-censorship. I was working by one-tenth of my capacity only. In Turkey in general, a lot of issues have become forbidden to be investigated and written about. This process will continue to be worsed." End of quote. And the crackdown of free, on free speech is not limited to journalists. A 16-year-old student went on trial for reportedly criticizing the president in a speech at a student protest. Another 13-year-old boy was pulled out of his school by police to testify about a Facebook posting that was deemed insulting to the president. As public and private televisions and most newspapers shy away from investigative reporting or even proper in reporting, an online community has grown. It gives some reason for optimism although the Turkish government currently blocks access to at least 30,000 websites. And among many taboos in Turkey, one of the most contentious issues is the Armenian Genocide of 1915. Hassan Jemal has not only openly discussed the topic, he apologized to Armenians for the crime and for the role his own grandfather, Jemal Pasha, played in masterminding the killings. Coming from a region with close ties to Turkey and a region that is still recovering from years of ethnic hatred, I must say, I am in awe of Hassan Jamal. The man we honor tonight, Hassan Jamal, has been called many things in his life. So he's father and husband. His wife, Aisha, is here with him. He's been called a CIA spy and a propagandist for the Kurdish. He's also been branded a traitor to Turkey and a thorn in the establishment's flesh. But the label that best describes him is journalist, and it's a badge he's worn proudly and sometimes perilously for nearly half a century. His career began at a political weekly in Ankara, the Turkish capital, in 1969. He's worked at a succession of newspapers, including Cumhuriyet, which is Turkey's oldest national daily, where he served as editor-in-chief for 12 years. He was also the paper's chief editorial writer. From 1992 to 2013, Hassan was a senior columnist at Sabah and then at Milliet. At both papers, he wrote columns six days a week. Now, our Newman fellows who are columnists know just how difficult a task that is, while the rest of us can only imagine. Milliet caused a political uproar in 2013 when it published accounts of secret meetings between the Turkish government and the imprisoned leader of the Kurdistan Workers' Party. 
Hassan defended the story in a column, which then turned out to be the last one he wrote for Milliet. Then Prime Minister Erdogan publicly criticized the original story and Hassan's column at a public rally, during which he said, down with your journalism. Under pressure from the government, Milliet suspended Hassan for two weeks. And then when he came back and wrote a column upholding journalists' right to publish, the paper refused to run it. And that ended Hassan's 15-year career at Milliet. Let me read you a few words from that censored column, which promptly found its way onto the internet. In democracies, politicians rule the country, and reporters report. This is how it works. The higher we hold the benchmark for journalism, the more that we own up to the values of independence and freedom in our profession, the more we insist on journalism against the odds, the higher we'll set the bar for our democracy and for the rule of law in this country. In his long career, Hassan hasn't shied away from sensitive topics, including uh, the status of Kurds and, as Vladimir mentioned, the Armenian genocide 100 years ago. His book, 1915, Armenian Genocide, was something of a watershed both for Turkey and for himself. In 2006, Hassan and four other writers were taken to court for criticizing attempts by Turkish judges to shut down a university conference in Istanbul concerning their Armenian genocide. As Hassan said himself a few months ago, questioning the points of view of political administrations has always been a difficult task in this country, and it is still a dangerous endeavor. But he continues to do it. He's still writing columns now on T24, an online news site, six days a week. Uh, on the seventh day, presumably, he rests. <laughs> he is also one of the founders of P24, the platform for independent journalism, which encourages editorial independence in Turkey and journalistic best practice. And he's no stranger to Harvard. He appeared here at a forum a little over five years ago. And on that same visit to Boston, he spoke at a foundation named after Hrant Dink, his late friend. Dink was a Turkish-Armenian columnist who was assassinated by a fanatical Turk outside his office in Istanbul in 2007. As Hassan said, asking questions is a dangerous endeavor. But Turkey is lucky to have journalists who continue to do so, and we Neiman Fellows salute them. We also salute Hassan, who has consistently championed freedom of the press throughout his illustrious career and who embodies the journalistic principle of speaking truth to power. Despite the government crackdown on the media these past few years, Hassan has written that he can still look to the future with hope. And as long as there are journalists like him, not just in Turkey, but around the world, we can too. There's one more thing that Hassan has been called. And that's from an admiring colleague who described him to us as the Ben Bradley of Turkish journalism. <laughs> So with that, let me make way for another Neiman Fellow, Anne, who comes from the very newspaper where the actual Ben Bradley worked. Um, so I'm here to present the Lions Award on behalf of all 24 Neiman Fellows from this year's class. Um, our class includes journalists from all over the world, uh, countries including Indonesia, Egypt, China, Cuba, Russia, and we wanted to recognize both your excellent career and work, but also all Turkish journalists who are working under increasingly difficult circumstances. So I'd ask all of you to please join me in congratulating Hassan Jamal and thank him for being here.